Welcome to the Hazel Rockets podcast, the number one golf podcast for new product launches, interviews with industry experts, golf trends, and more. Here are your hosts, Jen, Ken, and Bill. Hey, I'm Jen. I'm Ken. And I'm Bill. And we want to welcome you to this week's Hazel Rockets. Uh, this is our sixth show. Can you guys believe it? Fantastic. It's uh, Time flies when you're having fun. Staff was taking bets. We'd never get it this far. <laughs> well, they lose. Yeah. Uh, this week, we're excited because we have Mark Atterbury from Cobra Golf. He's going to be in studio here pretty soon. And I thought we'd talk to him not only about the new uh, irons that Cobra has released, but also what it takes to maybe be a golf rep and uh, his history in the business. That'd be good. Really good. It's awesome. one of our best. Yeah. Um, so, should we get started? Certainly. All right. Let's let let's let's dive in. What about, what's your funniest or most embarrassing moment that you guys have on the golf course? There's a question for you. Funniest, we told that, kind of that story a couple of episodes okay. ago. I mean, All right, with that, Kenny and his 13 some shot. wonderful feedback, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've probably got one more that's similar to that. So my very, very first men's golf tournament I ever played in, I had just won the Hagen Oaks Junior Championship, I think, four years in a row. And so I was 16 was playing in the Sacramento Men's City Championship, and I got are up on the sure? first Can tee. Can I just ask, are we sure that this is going into the funniest? Because so far this sounds a little bit like a bragging story. A little bit uh, bragging on the front end, but, okay. but brutal on the back end. Right. So I get up on the first tee of the McKenzie Golf Course, and Bill knows they have all these tents set up, and there's a big gallery behind the first tee, and they get up there and they announce me as Hagen Oaks's own Ken Morton Jr., four-time Hagen Oaks Junior Club champion. And I, literally, I'm sweating my socks through and literally shaking over the ball. How old are you? 16, probably. And um, all of the staff had come out to watch, and I am just shaken as can be. Okay, wait. Are you wearing your Payne Stewart... Uh, my knickers? Your knickers? It probably not. No, I did not think he was yeah, wearing the knickers so, on this one. So I get up there and swing about four times faster than I normally do. Because you're nervous. Yeah. Hit it directly in the heel of the golf club, and it literally just goes dead left right into the driving range OB. And that was different from any other tee shot you hit because... Because oh, normally it goes out to the right and then, <laughs> then to the left. Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, so I remember that one. We talked about that whip hook into the driving range often. So, so the negative was is I got to hit another shot off the uh, first tee and uh, very embarrassing. But uh, the number two, the positive was I got my name re-announced again. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. nice. Well, same, same intro or did they just let <laughs> Ken Warren Jr.? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So that was that was probably the most embarrassing shy of the thirteen I made on three in front of my yeah, best friend. That's definitely a good one. Yeah, for sure. I was thinking about embarrassing, funny. I mean, it wasn't really embarrassing for a lot of people other than myself. And of course, I shared the story. But at Bandon Dunes during the terrible weather. <laughs> yes. It what? was. Uh, Kenny and I were playing. We had another another one of our friends with us. We had a how many that year? We had I think twelve. Twelve of us that year. So we had three foursomes, or. Something like that. But I think it was only three of us playing. Anyway, on one of the back nine par fives, the weather was... A typhoon. A typhoon. Yes. About a Rain grain. sideways, winds 50, 60 miles an hour. Yeah. It was the, ugly. The worst that we had. But according to the caddies and all the locals, it really was only about a, what they say, five or six on a scale of one to ten of oh terrible weather. Oh my goodness. Weather. Yeah. But we were trudging through. We are having fun. I mean, if you want to call that fun. Um, but again, it's a memory maker. However, I'm I we teed off on the par five. Um, if you've not been to Bandon Dunes, there's it's very uh, natural. There's a lot of gorse and very gorse. Yeah, which is is that a bird? No, it's the most prickly, <laughs> prickly bush bush bushes you've ever been in. And, and if you put your hand in, your hand doesn't come back out. Correct. That's, yeah, I mean you would be stabbed beyond <laughs> recognition. And it's you know it it's not everywhere, but it's a lot of places. Yeah. So I'm you know and again I'm not the most fit person in the world. In case you haven't noticed, but I'm I'm sucking wind you by are this time. hot we, though. oh thank you thank you we have i think we have three holes or four holes left to play four holes this was the 15th hole and i'm already tired the wind's been howling it's pouring rain we're playing it's just wet but anyway the wind blew off my brand new rain hat and it's like well i i, I need that and so i it but it's running it's you know we're already <laughs> off the first tee the wind's blowing 50 miles an hour so i put my bag down and go back to get the, my hat and it's in this huge gorse. 
and I'm trying to is get it. Is Gorse it. a bush? A yeah, tree? It's, it's, it's a, a type of bush. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, I don't listen to him. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> prickly. It's a prickly bush. Can I get it? Ow! Oh, no! I can't. I can't. I try to can't, can't get my hat. I'm getting poked, but I finally get it back. I uh, run back to my golf bag. I pick it up. I have a big towel on there. Towel whips off. <laughs> Va- going back behind me vanishes. I want to get it into the gorse. Into the gorse. I'm like, all right, forget it. That I can do without. I start trying to walk up the fairway, and as I am going, all my clubs tip over, and all my clubs pour out onto the, onto the fairway. Yes, as any good best friend would do. I didn't run over and help him. I just left. He's him, dad so. stood there, 15 yards in front of me, <laughs> laughing at me the whole time. And as I went down to get my clubs, whoosh, my hat blew off again. Off and into the gorse. Into the gorse, <laughs> 100 miles backwards, and disappeared. And so I had no hat and no towel. And no clubs rag. from the side Well, I picked it. up my clubs and kept walking, but... It was, um, yes, it was very comical. At least I hope it came out as comical, yeah. and it's a great yeah. memory for us to talk about now. So The whole rest, we had two more rounds that year, yeah. and every time we saw a deer, we were like, Bill, I think that deer's wearing your hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The deer, the deer took my uh, mm. joy. So. <laughs> so one of the most uh, embarrassing kind of funny things that yeah. happened. Yeah. Awesome. Jennifer's right. not amused. I'm sorry, but hopefully you guys are <laughs> amused. And I don't have That's all that matters. So. Yeah. I don't have a story to If you're a golfer, it was funny, so. All right. Does anyone have any products that they want to share? I actually found one, but if you you look like you're ready. Yeah, let's. So. Kenny's going to do a little juggling here. So ready? I am not a clown. I only sound like one. A uh, new Wilson Staff 50 Elite Golf Balls in some radical new colors. So, um, you guys, we know we've carried 50 balls for a while. It's a 50 compression golf ball. Very, very, very soft. And uh, they just came out with a brand new um, 53 compression version of it. Um, and it, what's cool about it is not just the colors. So it comes in yellow, green, this vibrant red and orange. But not only is it super soft, they have pan head dipples. So What's a pan head dimple? So if you look at it, it's wider and much shallower than a typical dimple is. Yeah, probably can't see it on the camera. Yeah. Um, it, normally a uh, dimple is very concave and is kind of like a volcano if you think about yeah. looking down at, the, at the, the top of the volcano. This looks like a pancake, basically, but inverted. Yes, exactly. And so they're actually very flat. Um, inside the dimple. And what that does is it actually creates a higher trajectory than what a normal golf ball does. So um, for people that have lower club head speeds or have a difficulty getting the ball up in the air, this is actually going to help them create a little bit higher trajectory. It's really noticeable in the white versus some of the colors. And really vibrant colors. I mean, it's uh, it's done So what we have in our hand, we have a very vibrant, I have a yellow, you have a um, fluorescent green, a fluorescent um, uh, orange, a very fluorescent pink. They very much remind me of of almost what I would say when you go to like a miniature golf course, um, the color of those yep. uh, golf balls. Yeah. Um, just and to give you an vi- idea if you're listening to Unlike the to vivid us. balls, which are a matte finish, these actually, they put a clear coat over the top, so they're a little bit shiny. Shiny, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And these are out now? They're out taking now. In source now. And uh, what's the price? They are uh, fourteen ninety nine. So good value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. Um, and then I have one product that I brought to the table today because I thought it was fun. Um, and like I said, because I am the only one who is actually thinking about holiday gift giving, um, I got something last Christmas called like a hundred movies or something like that. It was like a bucket list for movies. And when we were in Atlanta this year at the gift show we found this 100 golf course scratch off bucket list. And what it is, and I'm gonna open this up, it's a, it's kind of like a movie poster. Can you see what size it is? Um, and it's basically this- 420 by 598 millimeters. That okay, well we're, we're wow. that's great for our international <laughs> listeners, but we're, that doesn't really help us. Yeah, looks so really it's easy about, to open too. About, I don't know, 18 inches by two feet. Is that about right? Um, And it's a bunch of scratch-offs of a bunch of courses that you might want to play in your life. And then as you play them, you would just scratch them off. So I'm sure Bandon Dunes is on here um, because you guys talk about that a lot. It is. Augusta National, Pinehurst, um, North Berwick in Scotland, Pebble Beach, 
um, uh, St. George's Hill in England. There's just a whole ton of things in here. I thought it'd be really kind of a fun gift item. Um, as people are looking for something to get the golfer who has everything that might be priced uh, economically, this is only $14.99. So it's another just fun little thing that would, the way it's packaged also would, uh, I think, fit really well in the stocking. Yeah. And I know it's well, early, everybody. I know I'm obviously the only one who's already thinking about um, Christmas, but... It's not... 1215 yet. I don't know what she's doing. 1224. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Oh, yeah. All right. But well, that is a nice gift idea. I think I it's agree. fun, don't you think? Very, very much so. If, if you have a man cave, you might want to just hang this up in there. Yep. All right. Do you guys... Did I got one other product. Oh, what's well, yeah. here? Brand new. So the uh, tailor-made spider putter has been uh, a massive hit since Jason Day and Dustin Johnson put it into play a few years ago. Uh, Day had a red one, uh, DJ had a black one. Um, they have a brand new version for 2020 that just hit shelves. Um, it's called the TaylorMade Spider X. It's got this cool blacked out uh, uh, shaft in it, but has this new stone color to it. Um, so a little bit different design. It's a little bit smaller, kind of a little bit more like the Spider Mini. Um, it has these two big tungsten uh, weights in the very back, but I think it's pretty stylish. It's got the uh, cool white insert in there and um, kind of dresses up the putter for the new year. Yep. And I just want to say, if you're listening to us on uh, the podcast of your uh, choice, thank you. Um, but if you want to check out any of these items that we're showing here, you can um, follow us either on HazelRocketsPodcast.com or you can check us out on our sponsor's uh, YouTube channel, Morton Golf Sales. Yep. And because uh, we are also filming this um, uh, for your benefit. Um, yeah. So there you have it. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to introduce our guests this week. Yeah. Uh, we have Mark Atterbury, who is our Northern California golf rep. Uh, he's our rep for Cobra and Puma Golf. He has over 20 years of experience in the golf industry. And with that, we're going to welcome Mark to our set. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. We're excited to have you on Hustle Rockets. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so as we transition from our opening segment into you, I think it's only fair to ask you what your most embarrassing or funniest golf story is on the golf course. I'll try to keep it PG, uh, but I was at Bandon Dunes many years ago with a very good friend of mine who is now a sales rep in the golf industry in another state. Um, and, you know, when you're just a long ways from the clubhouse and people aren't watching or so you think, you see things that you might not anticipate, uh, such as holding a putt, turning around, and seeing my friend with his pants down. <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I'd like to never re-see re that. Yeah, yes. I know. That's something you probably can't <laughs> unsee, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Burned in your retina forever. Oh, I am no. scarred. Yes. Thanks, Tim House. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shout out. All right. Let's, let's dive in. What got you into the golf industry? Uh... Shortly after high school, uh, as many of us do, I just kind of took the first job that came along, which meant that I was loading bags of concrete into customers' vehicles at the local Home Depot. That um, sounds terrible. I, you know, that it actually was the only time in my life that I looked as though I worked out. I actually had <laughs> muscles at that point in time. Um, it was pretty miserable, uh, so I jokingly asked a good friend of mine's father, who was the manager of a Nevada Bob's retail shop, if he needed any assistance, and I asked at the absolute correct time because he had a young man that had just graduated college. Uh, this was probably on a Friday, and that young man, his last day was that Sunday. So I very quickly went and bought myself a pair of slacks and a collared shirt and started at the Nevada Bobs that following Monday. Wow. Did you know immediately that you want to transition over into the, the rep side? or I didn't have a clue. Uh, I actually spent 15 years roughly on the retail side of the industry, mm -hmm. and... Um, I'll, I'll admit that by the end of that, I was actually a little bit jaded on golf, uh, and was looking for other opportunities. And when the retailer I was working for at that time actually decided they were going to close their doors, um, there were several sales reps that had come by and said, Hey, there are a couple of opportunities out there. We think you should interview. Um, I didn't know what the heck I was getting into, but, uh, it's been fun for the last eight years now being a sales rep. Great. Very cool. What do you believe are the key ingredients or the secret sauce to being a successful sales rep? Boy, I don't know. I think uh, 
I think just, I think at the end of the day, I realize that what I get to sell is smiles. I mean, this is not a necessity that anyone has to have. I mean, nobody has to have a set of golf clubs. This is something that we all do for fun. I try I to really, remember that every day. I'm going to stop day. you for a second. Yeah. I really like that, that what you're selling is smiles. I mean, what a, what a cool philosophy. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's so, I, I'm, you guys are quiet, but yeah. I, I'm oh, loving that. No, I mean, Mark's, I, I'll toot his horn for him. He, he does an amazing job making connections to uh, our sales staff, our golf professionals, anybody that's selling apparel, um, and then to the end consumer as well when they're having big events there. I mean, it's uh, it's all about human connections, and, you know, it's not about product at the end of the day. It's yeah, about- and I realize, too, and I'm sure you have dealt with these occasions far too often, but there are challenges that you run into when someone has paid $1,000 for a club set, and then we have to inform them, hey, we're missing the grips, we're missing the shaft. I mean, those are always challenges, and the consumer is absolutely correct for being angry at us in yeah. those positions. Um, we try to avoid them at all costs, but certainly I know we all bend over backwards to try to alleviate those headaches. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, we are selling smiles, but we're also digging into someone's pocketbook for, let's face it, not a small dollar amount. So anything that I can do to alleviate those issues or challenges it it just makes everyone's day better yeah now on a personal side i mean <clears throat> how many demo days trunk shows mobile pro shops you know all yeah. that type of stuff how many how many of those are you doing in the year uh including the guys that work demo days for me within my territory we're doing upwards of a hundred events of some form or uh nature um and that's just you that's, that's that that your includes territory. the guys that are yeah that's just my territory but that includes some guys that your are helpers. working mm-hmm. autonomous from me being present so a lot during the spring season once new products are launched that's when most of the demo days are going on and i employ a couple of guys underneath me to run around on saturday morning set up the tent set up the clubs for people to try um, I personally do certainly do a handful of those as well. Uh, but I'm also doing, you know, most of the demo techs, demo teching is a part-time job. Um, so they typically work Saturdays and Sundays if they're available Fridays, if we can get them. But because it is a part-time job, most of those guys have other careers where they work a full 40 Monday through Friday job. So if it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday event, I'm the one that's there. Often if it's a Friday event, I'm the one that's there. Um, the trunk shows are a little different in that like demo techs have access to demo clubs, but they don't have shoe samples or apparel samples. So the trunk shows, that's me. Uh, tournament shops, you know, you play in a tournament where it costs you $200 to be there and a portion of that is going to a, a fund for product. That's me uh, setting up clothing, shoes, accessories. So yeah. Everybody gets to go home with a nice prize. Yeah. yeah. Mark's one of our most traveled reps as he, he uh, visits all of the golf courses that don't normally get to see reps in the far <laughs> corners of our state and sometimes out of state. How many miles a year are you putting on your car? Uh, I'm actually, it's cut back a little bit, but uh, I've done as many as 45,000. I think currently I'm on pace for about 35,000 this year. Uh, I did lose a retailer out in Elko, Nevada, which is six hours east of Sacramento. Um, for those of you that don't know the geography of Nevada, once you get east of Reno, there's nothing <laughs> for a literally, long time. Literally, literally nothing. It's a lot of Highway 80. Yeah. So um, I just went camping with my two oldest boys out there, and I don't know if I'd ever been east of yeah. Reno, and it, it is a lot of nothing out yeah. there. It's so pretty, Elko is but... four hours east of Reno in the middle of the Great Basin. Um, surprisingly, though, I've been there a couple of times, and there is a lot of beauty in the state of Nevada that I think people are not familiar with. I found it absolutely breathtaking, yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah. What's a common myth about being a golf rep that you might want to debunk for people? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I walked the line of where I thought the golf reps didn't work and just ran around and, hey, check this out, and everybody was buying everything left and right, and it's not that. I mean, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of time on the road. Um to the guys out there, I'll admit it. I don't have any children or family that I have to get home to every evening. For those that do, kudos to you because that's that's hard. I mean, when you're waking up on a Friday morning in Fresno, three hours from home, you know, and Billy and Bobby and Susie got to get ready for school. You know, the wife is at home taking care of that. So uh, it's it, it's largely a male-dominated industry, I think, when it comes to sales rep. There are plenty of females out there, but it's a lot of guys that are out running around. So. Um, so what does your typical um, day as a sales rep look like? 
Boy, I don't know if there is a typical day. Um, in the world of sales repping, I mean, I, start, I get to write my own schedule, which has pros and cons. Um, the pros being that, you know, if I want to take a week off at Christmas, I typically do. The con is, come springtime, I don't see a day off for four months. So, you know, it's Monday morning, wake up, answer emails, make some phone calls, place orders, go visit accounts. So that's, that's you know, typically Monday through Saturday. And if there's a little bit of respite in the spring, Sunday is the day to... <sighs> Take a deep breath. Yeah. Or if you do take sometimes a week off just because you need it, does that put you behind? Oh, bit? absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it weighs on my heart heavily when, when I want to take a few days off, but I know those emails start adding up. Um, I try to, I love going to the northern coast of California. There's plenty of rugged remoteness up there, but I also try to go somewhere where I still have Wi-Fi access so that I can at least answer a few emails. Otherwise, by the time I get home from a three or four day trip, I know I've got a full day of answering questions just to get caught up. So it is hard. I mean, it's not this this just carefree life of being on the road. I mean, you're, you are sacrificing um, uh, some stuff just by... by Downtime, private time. I mean, you're working weekends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I try to be as accessible as possible to all of my customers. Uh, I mean, I've received text messages on Friday evenings at 8 o'clock that need attendance. Um, certainly, I try to attend to those. I mean, if... if if I can. Um, once the offices are shut down, sometimes there's information I can't gain access to until they reopen. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it is a lot of work. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's a job, right? Right. It's, for sure. It's just not a nine to five <laughs> job. There's a lot of travel, right? Yeah, exactly. I know you're always going the extra mile for us. And I, I, know I appreciate I, that. I'll sometimes have to send you an email when I don't want to, but you're always great about taking care of us. No so doubt. I appreciate that. No so. doubt. Well, and there are a couple different roles within the sales rep world. I'm an independent, which means that I work specifically for commission only. There is no base salary. There's no travel expenses covered. Um, what that leads to, though, is that I'm going to go the extra mile if and when I can to make that buck because I need it. You got to pay that mortgage, right? Yeah. So, Is there any advice you'd give to others who are just getting started in the golf business or wanting to transition into maybe a... A rep? Clearly, position? they should stay schlepping concrete. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you ever gave that up. Mark. That was a lot. There was a lot less stress. I'll admit that. Yeah, loading bags of concrete. Uh, I could go back to that, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> for about a day, right? Yeah, for about a day. I think yeah. my back would give out before. That. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, going back to what we talked about just a couple of minutes ago. I mean, just the realization that it is a lot of work. There's, there's no way around that. It can be a lot of fun too. Uh, and I have made. Some of my best friends are all in this industry. I mean, really all of my best friends are in this industry. Everybody that I know today is pretty much people I have met while either on the job for my retail days or now in my world of being someone calling upon the retailer. Um, I've made a lot of really lifelong friendships that you know I'll have forever. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing about the golf industry. It doesn't matter how big it is. It really is sort of a small place that's pretty family oriented. Absolutely. Yeah. Easy to do when you're selling smiles. Yeah. Well, I, I'll admit as well that I, I reap the benefits of working for a fairly known company or two. Um, I know that there are plenty of guys out there and gals that are, you know, selling products from companies that are maybe lesser known. And I, I know that that presents its own set of challenges. So there, there are a number of, again, the independent reps that are running around with 10 or 12 lines of product. Yeah. Um, that they need that many offerings in order to, you know, really make it make sense to travel those miles and pay for their gas and the hotel stays. Very fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving us a little insight into your world. You bet. Absolutely. And I think now we should dive into some of the new Cobra products. What do you think? Good stuff. Where do you want to start? All right. How about the new, uh, King tech and T roll irons? I think we'll let's, let's go there. All right. Um, let's start with the King forge tech irons. You got it. My question for you is why? What was missing from Cobra's lineup, and why did they feel they needed to introduce this club? There have been several manufacturers. Uh, I'll call them out, give them kudos. PXG, TaylorMade. Uh, Ping has been in this marketplace with a hollow cavity iron where it's been foam filled internally. Uh, I think uh, a lot of consumers know this, but this is, I wouldn't say overly revolutionary within the last couple of years. There were actually a number of companies presenting products of this design back in the early 2000s. I know that because I was on the retail side 
Oh, uh, Taylor made, made TPW was even earlier than that. It wasn't foam filled, but it was a hollow. Yeah, background. I remember one called the ICW. I think it was yeah, that was foam right. filled. Uh, there was a manufacturer out there. Unfortunately, they're no longer around. But a company called Nikent Golf mm-hmm. that offered an yep. iron and a wedge called the Arc Blade. Yeah, yep. uh, that was a it was a more of a rubber compound internally, but it's it's been done many a times before. Uh, I think PXG really put it on the map of what we know today. Uh, TaylorMade has had a lot of success with theirs as well. Um, the technology has been proven, so it, it feels great, it works. Uh, I think Cobra recognized that there was an opportunity to join that marketplace and present an iron at a competitive price uh, that we could offer right alongside those other proven and true, true tested and tried irons. Awesome. What's the ideal player for? Uh, the ideal player, this category is kind of referred to as the player's distance iron. I don't know that you necessarily have to be, I get a little worried when they call it a player's distance because that might turn off the 15 handicapper that could certainly play this club. Um, you, it, It's maybe not the most forgiving offering that Cobra offers, but it's intended to be a great feeling iron, plenty of distance to it. Uh, I think that you could be as high as a 15 or even a 20 if you're a reasonable ball striker. Um to play this iron for sure. What have you seen when you're fitting people in this category of iron out on the floor? I mean, it, yeah, it would, as far as them wanting this type of a club yeah, or, yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, even if you're a middle handicapper or a higher hand, handicapper, they love having something that's made for them that has the feel that, you know, still feels good and performs. I mean, definitely forgiveness is something that's probably the most important, but being able to couple that with the club that feels fantastic is, is important to them. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah we, we see that. And with, with these irons, what we're seeing, unlike the ICW and some of the early iterations, the face thinness is night and day different than what those are. And we're creating rebound effect and COR numbers that rival those of woods now in irons. Correct. And they can't do that without these special foam-filled irons. There's a gentleman that works in the Cobra offices who has early, early, early access to try this product. Uh, And he told us at our sales meeting just recently that he is a full club longer than he was with his previous iron set. And not because the lofts are juiced or anything like that. He was playing the previous iteration of this club, which is the same loft. But to your point, with that thinness of the face and the rebound effect, he's picked up a full club in distance. Wow, that's cool. All right. I also want to talk about Bryson Deschambeau. Yes. Uh, and the whole one length um, phenomenon, because I know this club comes in one length. It's offered in that. I realize it's a niche market, but can you explain the concept behind the whole one length irons um, and how that has been performing for you guys? Yeah, it's been performing very well. I think what we are as a company trying to overcome, there's a lot of people that think that the one length concept means that you have to swing like Bryson, which is not the case. Uh, many golfers are very capable of hitting a seven iron with great repetition and great success. Uh, it's kind of right in the middle of the iron set, which is why Cobra went with the seven iron length. It's also what Bryson and his coach Mike Shy developed years ago. Um, they found that the seven iron length was a good combination of being able to hit the long irons just fine, but also control the short irons. Um, I find that many consumers, um, particularly on the beginner side of the market, when they turn around and ask their swing coach, where do I put this one? Well, if we can eliminate that as a question and just the same spot as the last one, the same spot as the last one. It can make it a lot simpler for that golfer as far as their setup goes. Um, Certainly many golfers have played golf for a long time with what we know as variable length or traditional length irons. For those golfers that are open to the concept as well, the very established players, um, it's a great way to just increase that repetition and that simplicity even for that highly skilled golfer. Certainly, we're not selling it as an end-all, be-all for all golfers. The The beauty is that the one length starts a conversation specifically around Cobra. Come on out. Try the one length. If it's not for you, no sweat because we make every model that we make in a one length. We make it in a traditional length set as well. So it's increasing the conversation around our brand, which is great for us on both variable and one length trials. We've actually, interesting, uh, <laughs> the customers that play one length are so passionate about one length. Correct. I mean, they're... They're in it, and they're in it forever. Um, it's just, you know, it's a different client that adapts into that program. And a so, different mindset, huh? Yeah. yeah. 
uh, we, I find the really kind of organized the accountant type who, you know, everything has its own place, the 14-way divider bag guy, that's the guy that's usually more open to trying it than the freewheeling guy, just because he understands that consistency in the same motion over and over and over again with the same length golf club with only the loft change gives him the best chance of repeating the swing the same way. I've also found we've done some interesting fittings for golfers that are maybe like extremely tall or extremely short, where on the shorter spectrum, maybe every club is variable length below the seven iron, but then nothing is longer than a seven iron. So you can split the sets where like your four, five, six are your seven length iron length, but then your shorter irons are your variable down to a shorter wedge. Interesting. Vice versa, I've come across some guys that are six foot seven that they can't wow. get down to their wedges. So they'll play the seven iron length from the seven iron down to the wedges, but then still play longer or variable length, wow. longer irons. I thought of that. So you can split it up. Yeah. Um, I've tinkered with it quite a bit myself. Certainly found the long irons in a one length setup to be much easier to strike with consistency. Uh, I too, like some golfers though, I mean, I've been playing for 25 years and just putting a wedge down that was seven iron length to me was a little bit awkward, but I loved it for the four iron because it was so much easier to strike for consistency. And Marty, for our <laughs> viewers and listeners that don't know, how does Cobra achieve the distance differences with all? With yeah, so it's much? taken a lot of R&D. Uh, Tech 3, this club, is now the fourth generation of the one length concept. Uh, every year it's gotten better and better. Uh, they've done... Th in order to achieve a one length set, you have to make every head weigh the same as a seven iron. So it's not a matter of just cutting down your long irons and extending your short irons. Because in order to balance the set appropriately, you actually have to make different club heads that weigh the same as the seven iron. Um, the loft is the largest factor that has a distinguishing you know, impact on total distance. So the lofts are still corresponding. Um, but getting the weight right within each head was the biggest challenge to overcome initially, where they've had to hollow out portions of the short irons. They've had to add weight to some of the long irons in order to make those launch more yeah, appropriately. For those that don't know, in a typical set, three iron heads are much lighter than a pitching wedge head. Correct. But in this case, they all have to be exactly the same. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then they've tinkered with the shaft tipping so that you get the proper launch on the long irons. Also to control the flight on the short irons. If you have an extremely long short iron, some golfers tend to hit it high. Uh, so they've had to stiffen the tips on the short iron shafts to keep that trajectory down, control it. Oh, yeah. very cool. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move us into the Cobra's new T-Rail hybrid iron set. <clears throat> yes. It's built for recreational players who struggle to create ball speed and keep their shots airborne. Can you walk us through the distance and forgiveness benefits associated with this set? Absolutely. So a lot of golfers are playing a hybrid or two. Um, this set takes it to the next level where a golfer can play a hybrid pretty much throughout the entire set. So we do have a traditional shaped hybrid available for the four, five, and six iron. Um, we do also have the opportunity of selling that consumer a hybrid iron. So it's a four, five, and six more the shape of an iron, but it has the benefits of a hybrid where it's got the large back, it hollow internally again. Uh, just creates an extremely high MOI for your iron set. And this, when did this come out? This uh, officially launched November 1st. So we are just brand new First to Marketplace. Week. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. What's the uh, retail on it? This is an 899 iron set, graphite shafted. We do also offer a corresponding ladies version. The biggest difference on the ladies is really just the cosmetics, uh -huh. uh, but same technology where we've got the four, five, and six in the hybrids. You can also do the irons. The hybrids tend to launch a little bit higher, a little bit more forgiving. Um, the name T-Rail comes from the fact that we have a couple of rails on the sole of the club, which helps that club head glide through the turf. Uh, Cobra's actually done a lot of testing where... The, the rails certainly help keep the club head straight when it's traveling through the turf, but they actually help maintaining speed through the turf as well. If you've got a flush, flat sole, when you make contact with the turf, it actually slows it down fairly rapidly. Uh, but with the T-rails, it helps that club glide through and maintain that speed. So therefore increasing your distance on those shots out of the rough. We talk a lot about the videos we, we do about <coughs> moment of inertia. And the, the goal in golf clubs is to get the uh, weight as low and far away from the face as you can. And so with a hybrid iron that allows you to do that fairly easily because it's much, much wider than a normal iron is. So again, the further you can get the weight back away from the face, the less it's gonna twist when you hit it on the heel and toe. So 
um, you know, that's hugely advantage, uh, advantageous for the uh, you know middle to higher handicap player who hits the ball all over the place. This iron's going to be much, much straighter. Yeah. I, uh, I actually received a text from one of your salespeople last night that uh, she sold a set yesterday, and just the, the, the end of the text said, I'm going to sell a ton of these. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good to yeah. hear. It's really nice. easy to hit. Yeah. I love the cosmetics, too. Yeah. They're kind of all black. Uh, Sharp. Yeah, they're very uh, Darth Vader-ish. There's no doubt about that. And I won't be able to go into too much depth on this as of yet, but the cosmetics of these irons also will match into a metal wood launch that is coming down the road from uh, Cobra. So there will be corresponding metals that will match in, so you can kind of create a more complete set within this same concept. Nice. And that's going to go into my final question, Uh-oh. which is as we head into 2020 and beyond, <laughs> yep. what's on the horizon for? Uh, Cobra does have a number of items up its sleeve. I may or may not have uh, access to that information. Um, there's all kinds of legal issues within the industry where we have to keep things somewhat secret from competing from vendors more than anybody else. Uh, but Cobra does have a complete line of new products coming in January that we will be able to discuss publicly here very soon. Awesome. I was privileged to see some of it at the hot list. It's really, really good. There we go. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Well, with that, thanks so much for being on our show. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me. All right. And we are going to launch into our commercial and following that, our Jack Bergeroni experience. Hey, Bill here. I wanted to pause real quick to thank our sponsor, MortonGolfSales.com. Morton Golf Sales is the number one online retailer for all your golfing needs. From the newest clubs on the market to the classics that you can't find anywhere else, Morton Golf Sales has the best products and customer service at the lowest possible prices. Want to check out their huge online inventory of clubs, clothing, golf balls, accessories, and save 12% on your first order? Just use coupon code ROCKETS at checkout on mortongolfsales.com. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Now, back to the show. Mom's Beef Hash has a first name. It's from a can we see. But we all have another name. We call it untasty. We hate to eat it every day. And but if you, you ask us why, we'll say. Because Mama's hash tastes like trash and we should feed it to the dog. Welcome to the Jack Burgeroni Experience. Hey, welcome back. Welcome to Jack Burgeroni. What is Jack Burgeroni? Oh my gosh, you guys keep... Someday we'll talk about Jack Burgeroni. All right. Not today. Still letting us down. All right. This, week top... this week's topic, I thought we would talk about some of our just coolest or most memorable stories on the golf course. Our coolest or most memorable stories on the golf course. All right, so go ahead, Jennifer, you start. Oh, wait a minute. I do have one. Oh, okay. I do have one. Yeah. I know you're like, you don't play golf, but I do have Did I one. Say that? I didn't say that. Yeah. Uh, how about when we went to Augusta National Ooh. and got a pretty spectacular tour we by uh, the barber? Who was at, at that time at Augusta for over 50 years. Yeah, yes. he was in, I think, close to 90 years old yes, and gave us a private tour. Thanks to my connections in the golf industry. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and actually, yeah, it was the three of us that had this private tour, and it was spectacular and something we'll always remember. Should we give the audience what really happened yes. at Augusta National, though? we should. Oh, sure. I'll let you do that since you're sitting next to her and you're... <laughs> uh, but I might get hit. You're the husband, yes, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so but we're are out. You, where are you going with this? We get this, again, <clears throat> it's off-season. There's not a soul on the entire property. Anymore. I'm like 16 years old. Yes, and not a golfer and have no idea what Augusta what, National is that or why we're even there. And Bill and I are walking around like it's kind of golf heaven, which it which kind of is. is. Exactly. Hollow ground. It we, is. We, we all know it's hollow ground. But. Totally, and probably the only time we might ever set foot there. And so so they he takes us to a sand pit. No. no. Oh my gosh. Right there, you're, you're, you're exactly. Okay. They're not called sand pits. No, it's They're a called bunker. Bunkers and no, it wasn't. It wasn't the bunker, was it? It, it, it was, was the there bunker. Was, I thought it we was... just went to like a mound of sand somewhere. <laughs> there is usually mounds of sand in bunkers, but yes. That was, Among other I have things, a really we, bad memory, people. We went so, on, yes. Yeah, so the barber is telling us, I mean, what's super cool about the sand in all the bunkers at 
at uh, Augusta National is that it's powdered granite that they import from North Carolina, yeah. right? So it's the fluffiest, most... Like sugar. It is. I mean, it's like powdered sugar almost. almost. It's that fluffy in there. and So these two are there in the... Bunker. Sand no, in, pit. In the sand pit. It makes it sound <laughs> like it's... Like we're Harrison Ford trying to get away from the, the <laughs> okay. I think Augusta. I, I I don't want any more like hate mail. Um, I think Augusta National is just an iconic course now. It's back when I was for its sand pits. Yes. Back yes. when I was sixteen and not a golfer. She couldn't understand why we were running our fingers through. They it were and, we were and, and, and in my head, amazement. I'm literally just I I I remember this story as just being a mound of sand somewhere, but. They literally were taking it and just going like this. Oh, yes. Like and they were making love a... to the sand people. It was a little over the top. And if she had been wearing a watch that day, she would have been looking at it, wondering when we were going to leave as no soon as possible. Doubt. Right? Yes. So, yeah. But that was just one of the things. And we were able to go. This gentleman took us onto the golf course. Uh, we went to hole number twelve, number thirteen, number Amen fourteen, corner. Yeah. fifteen. Amen corner. Um, yeah, up to sixteen. Yep, sixteen. Yeah, I just uh, remember sixteen. That pond being so little small compared to what you see yeah, exactly. on TV. Yeah, uh, we got it. Then we and again, we were actually able to go on the holes themselves. We were out down on the thirteenth fairway, uh, on the eighteenth tee box, looking at that tee shot, which is completely straight uphill, like you can't imagine from again yeah. television. And I remember and even <laughs> as a sixteen-year-old, totally non-interested in any of this girl, um, uh, thinking it was really cool how they had heaters underneath all of the, the greens. greens, underneath all of those flowers, where they would just time it. Control the temperature. So that winter. they could have those flowers <laughs> bloom right during Master's Week and yep. absolutely had 100% control over that. And this was 30 years ago? A couple ago? of decades ago. Yeah. Yes. Gosh. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the technology back then was amazing. Um, and I can't even imagine, you know, today what they've... Um, yeah. what they're doing. It wasn't there. a blade of grass out of place and the whole yeah. place was amazing. So that's a wonderful, memorable golf story from Kenny and I. So Jennifer, what do you have? For us? <laughs> I don't know. I would say as a non-golfer that I brought something pretty cool to the table on this. So hmm. what do you guys have? Probably the hmm. most memorable uh, experience on a golf course I had was uh, back in 1990, actually the same year we actually visited Augusta National actually. Because we, I went from Congressional Country Club where I worked a season at, um, down to visit you down in Georgia with Bill, and then he and I drew, drove back across the the United States on my Civic. Um, but while I was there, this was uh, uh, when Bush and Quail were in office. Uh, Quail was a member, and actually uh, uh, George Bush was as well. H. W. Bush. Yep. Yeah. Um, but Quail would come over probably once a week Where? and play golf at Congressional Country Club while I was there. And uh, over the course of that <laughs> summer, got to know him a little bit and had many a conversation. And it was pretty a remarkable experience. Late in that summer, Rick Riley, who was the uh, main Sports Illustrated writer, he, he on the very last page of Sports Illustrated, he would write a column uh, every week. And it was he's a very famous, uh, iconic writer, still is. Um, he actually came with his um, his editor from Sports Illustrated and played a round of golf. Illustrated or Illustrator? Illustrated. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And that's another strike against you. Too. <laughs> yeah. And she doesn't like Caddyshack. But we... <laughs> or Augusta National. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Augusta National. <laughs> so Rick Riley, his editor, Kent Casey, who is our head golf professional, and Dan Quayle all played a foursome of golf, and I got to caddy for Kent Casey, our head golf professional, during wow, that round of golf. Wow, what an honor. And it was wild because there was like 20 secret service. I had to be frisked before we went out onto the golf course. Um, at the turn, Kent told me to go in and get drinks, and again, two secret service came in and uh, with me to the grill and watched me pour drinks, and then... You know, didn't help carry any of it out, but just watched me go back out and, and Did you ask them to frisk like you stuff. again? Did you probably enjoy that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the following week in Sports Illustrated, there was a column uh, of Rick's uh, round of golf with the vice president. And it was... Didn't just, you get tackled or something? Uh, so actually, yeah. So uh, after the round, I went back in to go to get drinks and was hustling. And I didn't get tackled, but uh, I, I got stopped 
uh, uh, sternly, sternly, yes, by Secret Service as I came back out. So, um, but it was it was pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was Secret Service down each of the fairways, and uh, they'd be a hole ahead and a hole behind. And again, being out here on the West Coast, we're just not privy to that level of protection, and it was kind of wild just being right in the middle of it. So that was that was a story. It is a fun story. Yeah. I actually have one for you to tell, if, oh, unless, yeah. but I don't know if you're going to go no, with it. No, go, go ahead. I would like for you to tell about the hurricane uh, and your time in Hawaii. I That's... think that is a pretty remarkable... I know it's not necessarily directly a golf story, but I mean, um, I it's mean, it because a, of it golf, golf that you were there. It is a golf story, but it wasn't really on the golf course. Yeah, yeah. but let's. I think that's a pretty amazing story. It's, yeah, it is, okay. Um, uh, the Reader's Digest short version is... And then I will expand on it. <laughs> I was uh, living on the island of Kauai in, uh, in Hawaii <laughs> in the early 90s, and uh, Hurricane Aniki was rolling through. Uh, two of our good friends at the time had come over to the islands to visit me. Um, the day they got there the day before the hurricane was supposed to come in, but the hurricane was supposed to hit the island of Oahu and not Kauai. And so um, we thought we might get some winds and some blustery conditions, but nothing that would constitute a hurricane on Kauai itself. Uh, so when we went to uh, bed that evening, that's what we knew. Uh, the hurricane had turned in the middle of the night. We never turn on a news broadcast or the radio again. Uh, we got up super early in the pretty much in the, in the dark because we had to drive to the other side of the island. There's only one road on Kauai. We lived on the North Shore, or I did, and we had to drive to the South Shore to play 36 holes that day. Um, as we were driving in the dark, we're noticing lots and lots of cars lined up at gas stations, and we were curious as to why all these people were lining up at the gas stations because obviously they didn't know that the hurricane wasn't coming our way. It was going to Oahu. Well. We were the dumb ones. We didn't realize that it had turned and was going to be hitting Kauai around 11 a.m. that morning. Uh, we were down on South Shore by about 6 a.m., still <clears throat> not realizing our folly. Again, we're from the West Coast, from California, never experienced a hurricane in my life up to that point. Uh, we went to the first golf resort we were going to play at. The windows were boarded up. They were taped up and boarded up. There wasn't a soul anywhere. We thought, huh. Why are these people, uh, why do they have the course closed? But, well, I guess we'll wait and we'll putt on the putting green until someone shows up to open it up so we can play. And we putted and putted and putted. And in those days, we had a lot of putting for, for money. Gambling was super fun. Uh, for about, could be around between three and four hours worth of time. You literally stayed there for three to four hours waiting for someone to show up without really questioning well, it? Well, y- yes, and because we were having so much fun taking, you didn't care. taking money from each other because okay. that's what we did. And the putting green was wonderful, and we had a great time. And so at this point, the wind went from 10, 20, 30. It was blowing probably 40 miles an hour. And so at that point, I said... About an hour t- short of correct, the, the hurricane. hurricane actually hitting the island head on. Right. I went into the... Uh, they had a lanai area that was open, and there was a payphone. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but I decided <laughs> to use the payphone to call our friends who still were at the North Shore. And they panicked as soon as they picked up the line and said, Where are you three, the three of you? The hurricane is hitting us. It's going to be here in an hour. And so we, I, we, I hung up the phone and we discussed it and we thought, okay, well, it takes usually a minimum of an hour to get back. And we were kind of like, we might not make it. So why don't we go to the Hyatt Hotel, which was just down the street, have some lunch, wait for this hurricane thing to <laughs> blow over, and then we'll play in the afternoon at the Hyatt course. That's how dumb I was and the two friends that I were with were. We thought that might happen. So we decided well, to... Well, in your teens and your 20s, you're invincible, too. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know if I should get into some of the other things, but the bottom line is we... So we left this resort. We drove a couple minutes to the Hyatt. We parked the car. We left the clubs in the car. We walk into the Hyatt Hotel, and it was like a movie. It was pandemonium. There were people running right towards us, carrying their children, carrying their luggage, and they had were basically, the entire hotel was being evacuated into one central gigantic ballroom. And uh, there were some employees that said, who are you three, or what are you doing? And we said, oh, uh, we just came in. And they said, well, you need to follow us. And we went into this ballroom. There were cameras being set up. They had a giant television with CNN weather. 
And for the first time, we saw the size of Hurricane Iniki barreling towards Kauai, uh, turning into a Category 5. And so we, at that moment, finally sat and said, I guess we're not going to play golf today. And um, Did you have a clue still at that point what that meant? N- not really. Okay. Not really. Again, um, there's, uh, we, again, the Hyatt staff took incredibly good care of us. They were feeding everybody and keeping everybody calm. And um, we, the hurricane hit and we were holed up there. Um there's lots of other silly things that happen. I know. Come on, you okay. need to tell some of it because it's it's a pretty remarkable story. I okay. mean, uh, so you guys were in that that place at one point in time. What happened? So after we were there for several hours, all of a sudden we could see that the employees were starting to suddenly move all of us from the ballroom. They were starting to get a little panicked, they right? Were, yeah, they were starting to move all the guests out. And so then, you know, and we're wondering where everybody's going, but they're being ordered out and, and it's organized. And so we decided to ask and they said, uh, we look up and there's these big panel, the ceiling was, or, or the roof, I should say, had, um, I want to say a six way skylight, basically, that was part of the roof and it was glass and it was bubbled and it was shaking like you couldn't imagine with the winds. And so they, I guess, had a feeling that it wasn't going to last. And so all of the patrons were, or no, it's not patrons, pardon me, the, the guests were moved out. So we said, again, we're 20 something cool guys, can we help? And they said, yeah. So we started helping people, moving furniture, getting people out. And we were some of the last people out with the employees. And no sooner did we all get out when that the, the skylight imploded imploded down and all the glass went on into the ballroom where everybody was just a few minutes before. So the Hyatt really did take care of the Yeah, they were smart. Day. And you don't want to know where they sent us. They had an underground, and I'm sure it's probably still there, even though the Hyatt doesn't control that hotel anymore, an underground bomb shelter. So full cement walls you know concrete i don't know how thick they were but they were down it was a system of tunnels that went there was it was like a spoke and all these tunnels went down for a mile each way and that's where they lined all of us up everybody had to take a seat against this cement wall through these tunnels and that's where we held up for the rest of the afternoon in the hurricane and then again they had these food carts coming by and pushing them and said can we feed you something what would you like to drink what would you like to eat so it was kind of cool in that respect i because for us, it is always basically about the food, right? I mean, all the, sto- say, all I the say, stories. I have a fondness for food, in case anybody didn't know that. But, uh, uh, yes. So. And then the aftermath. I, it's, I, the story continues. I mean, It does. It got dark, obviously. The whole time, I just bought a car like the week before, simply because I'd been living there for almost a year. My friends had come over and, to get transportation. I bought a used car. But only thing we cared about, not even so much the car, we cared about our three sets of golf clubs. They were in the trunk. Are the clubs okay? Did the car turn over? Is it blown away? And where's our clubs? Oh, yeah, and where's our clubs? I mean, that's all we cared about. So, we, the, the hurricane, we were getting reports. It had been, it finally, in, in the early evening, was downgraded to a tropical storm. Um, we noticed in one of the tunnels, as we went a little exploring, that there was a giant exit door. Did you guys sneak out? Two, two of our party did. I stayed watch because I was the smart one. So our two of our friends opened the door and there was another couple of hotel guests were like, hey, you guys shouldn't be doing that. And we we're like, yeah, no, we're okay. We know what we're doing type of thing, even though we didn't know what we were doing. Well, these two of our friends went out to go check on our car and our clubs. And when they were... <laughs> Tropical storm, the wind was still blowing. I don't remember how hard, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, maybe even more. Um, they, they went out to check the car, and they were running like the bionic man with the wind going 100 miles an hour. And then when and the, the car happened to be fine. It did not move. The clubs were secure. On their way back, they could barely get back to the, the exit door because I was going to let them in. I was guarding the door because otherwise they wouldn't be able to get back in. Um, and they could barely return because the wind was so strong against them running coming on the same path. So once I let them back in... We thought we need to get back to the North Shore. I don't know why we thought that. I don't. I mean, we're, we're just dumb. We thought we're, we don't want to stay here, so we the don't three, want to stay in a five star resort. <laughs> we might as well get down back a brick home. hallway or a cement hallway. The three they of had us more tea times later in the week. Well, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that has never happened. But so then the three of us decide to leave and get back to the car, 
and again just brainless young guys but we the the tree there were trees down everywhere there were powered lines down everywhere at one point we on the road we tried to return where we were coming from and there were power lines and trees down there were emergency crews yelling at us like what do you we were in the middle of these phone power lines down with sparks going and navigating through them and they're like you need to leave you can't be here what are you guys doing uh we kept trying to find open roads to go where we could um until we literally were stuck in the middle of the island with with nowhere to travel the road the main road the one road i told you that is is between the north shore and the south shore every 50 feet or 20 feet there was a power line and a pole down blocking the road so even if we were trying to wind through them you couldn't pass them eventually um we ended up staying at some very nice people's house that were this lady was out there with a lamp telling us to come stay at her house and oh, that was really that nice itself, uh, we, we had actually passed her once and said no we're okay we're going to keep going because she looked a little scary although they were very nice in the end we returned because we had nowhere to be and we said we'll take you up on your offer and that's a story in itself uh going to this this place that we thought we were going to be um dinner Yes. Uh, the, 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 I want to just have you guys picture laying the, th the three guys in their golf clothes, golf slacks and shirts like this on the middle of their living room floor with all these strange people around and these big animals and and wait, live animals or Oh yeah, like big dogs and different things and their like, different things. Their conversation like, was very strange and we all had slept with an eye open the whole time because we were afraid to actually close our eyes and as soon as daylight hit, we jumped up and thanked them all very much and got out of there as fast as we can could. So uh, th thankfully we, we made that, but um, yes. We eventually made it back to the North Shore with some more high adventure. We almost, the car almost flipped over into a big muddy lake of water because we, again, we were trying to find a road. We went into a cane field and found this dirt road. It wasn't dirt, it was mud. And the car was spinning and sliding off this cliff and uh, my buddy was driving my car. I was leaning on the right to keep the car on the on the right side so it wouldn't fall in off the cliff and to the left. And um, oh my god! Yeah, I, it's, it's a miracle that we made it back actually. And then for like a week, I mean, not you guys were, were like showering in like the the. There was no pool. water, no electricity. Uh, the golf resort that I worked at, we had a swimming pool that was the whole place was closed. Obviously, the island was shut down. If you've ever been to Princeville Resort, the uh, Lanai. Uh, pro shop is all glass all the way around. Oh, that was, yeah, at the Prince Course, yeah, right? Yeah, and was... just, oh yeah, and, and every, you, you said every window was oh, blown out. Blown and, out. Yeah. And it was like a scary, tattered, you know, curtains were waving through, yeah. but we were down at the other course, the Mackay course, and the pool had glass in it from the windows of our pro shop at all. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to keep people out. We were trying to protect the pro shop. Um, and then the National Guard came eventually and because our two friends you know weren't actually residents there they were able to get lifted out eventually on the air uh the military transport and um i stayed there for a little while longer but yeah it was it was pretty crazy so i would say that we we brought to this conversation three fairly <laughs> memorable uh golf stories yes. bill wins bill wins i don't know yeah. about that but yes yeah yes. All right, so there you have our uh, our three uh, most memorable uh, golf stories. We want to hear yours as well. So go ahead, leave a comment for us. We'd love to hear them. And with that, we're going to bring this episode to a close. If you like it, be sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you're looking for any new golf equipment, check out our sponsor, MortonGolfSales.com. MortonGolfSales.com. With that, we'll be back next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.